All right. Hey, kiddos. We're going to, um, I'm going to go over the study guide with you because you guys have a test coming up um, on day three. And you need to be ready because it's going to be roughly uh, 35 questions, mostly multiple choice, but a couple short answer. And you're only going to have about 45 minutes to do it. Okay. So you need to be ready. You need to be prepared. Um, so here we go. Here's a list of topics you guys are going to need. Um, if you want to, as you're studying, check the little boxes and make sure that you have looked over each and every one of those topics. For this first one here, it says you need to uh, measure to the correct number of sig figs. Um, okay, so this would be 20 and this is 30. So this must mean the big line here is 25. And it means that each of these lines must count for one. So that's 21, 22, 23, 24. It looks like it's, remember, you want to read from the bottom of the meniscus. That means the bottom of the curvy line. So it looks like it's right on the 24. So can I just put 24? No, I can't, okay? Because this counts by ones, you need to go one place further. You need to go to the tenths place, okay? Because it's because what if it was between the 24 and the 25, right? So that means that we need to have, if we think it's exactly 24, then I can put 24.0. But I can't just leave it as 24 because that's not the correct precision, okay? So you always need to go one further than whatever the me measurement measures. So like this one, for example. This one is 6, this one's a 7, so this must be 6.1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. This looks like it goes to about 6.6. .6. But this, each line, each gradation, or graduation, whatever you call it, is um, is 0.1 milliliter. So I need to go one step further than 0.1. I need to go to the hundredths place rather than the tenths place. So if I think it's exactly on the 0.6, then I can put 6.60. If you would put 6.61, it kind of looks like it could be that as well. That would also be correct, okay? This one. <clears throat> this one, this is 40, this is 50, so this must be counting by ones. One, two, three, four. So this is between the 44 and the 45. So I'm gonna, so it's definitely 44 point something, and the last digit, remember, is always estimated. So I think it's gonna be about 44 point six. Okay. Um, one, two, three, four. Yeah, that sounds about right to me. And remember, these are all milliliters. On the test, I think I tell you not to use units um, when you type in your answer because it confuses the computer. Um, so just follow the directions that, I, that I'll give you on the test. Okay? Um, now this question says, um, what refers to how close measurements are to each other and how repeatable they are? That's precision. Precision. So if you have a lot of numbers that are very close to each other, that's that means they're precise. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're accurate. Accuracy... Accuracy refers to how close measurements are to an accepted or actual value, okay? So if I like, I know that uh, the block is one gram, but my scale keeps telling me it's 1.5, um, then that's not an accurate scale, okay? Okay, write the number of sig figs for each. This would have three sig figs. This one would have four sig figs. Remember, the zeros on the end only count if there's a decimal, which there is a decimal, so that would make them significant. The leading zeros do not count. So this would only be three sig figs because those leading zeros do not count as significant. Since zeros in the middle, they always count. Okay, so this would be one, two, three, four, five. This zeros on the end only count if there's a decimal. Is there a decimal? Nope, no decimal. That means not significant. So that only has two sig figs. This same thing, this would only have three sig figs. The one, the zero, and the two are significant. Zeros on the end only count if there's a decimal, which there's not. In scientific notation, if I want to know how many... Um, Sig figs there are in a number in scientific notation. Um, I have to look at the, just this, this number right here, okay? I don't worry about that when I'm talking about sig figs. I just look at this. This has two sig figs, okay? Again, just look at this part. This has three sig figs, okay? Okay, it says a material has a mass of 500 grams and a volume of 1.20 milliliters. What's the density? It tells me that density equals mass divided by volume. Mass divided by volume. So I'm going to do my mass which is grams, 500 grams, divided by my volume, which is 1.20. Let's put that in my calculator. 500 divided by 1.20. And I get this number here. Okay. <clears throat> so that's 400. I'm going to write my unrounded answer here. Okay. 
Now, I need to figure out how many sig figs I'm rounding to. This has three sig figs. This only has one sig fig. How am I supposed to round this to one sig fig? You're going to have to just go to your second sig fig over. If you only need one sig fig, go to your second one over. If it's less than five, then it just doesn't bump anything up, and the rest is going to turn to zero. So this rounded to one sig fig will be 400. I know. It's weird. It's super weird. And that would be grams per milliliter. I know. It seems weird, but if I only have one sig fig, I can only round it to one sig fig. You, have, you can only round it to whatever your what, whatever's given in the problem, whichever one has less sig figs. That's what will determine how many sig figs you round your final answer to. Okay? Okay. Um, what's the density of a rock that has a mass of that and a volume of that? So remember, density, it says here, is mass divided by volume. So I'm going to do my mass divided by my volume. Let's put that in the calculator. 0 0.010 0 divided by 40.0. And I get 0 0.00025. Okay. How many sig figs do I need? This has two sig figs. Because there's a decimal, the zero on the end counts. So this has two sig figs. This has three sig figs, so I have to go with the lesser one. I can only have two sig figs. So, and it's in two sig figs currently, but it says express it in scientific notation. So let's put this in scientific notation. So you're going to move this until there's only one number to its left. Do, 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 stop. Okay, and then you get 2.5 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4. I moved it four times, but because this is a little tiny number, a number less than 1, it's got to be a negative exponent. Okay, and that'd be grams per minute. So that would be your answer. And that's only two sig figs, right? Because you only look at the number right there. Cool. Okay, last one here. Um, okay, so we need to learn how to put this in our calculator. If you remember, it's 3.00E24. Remember, the E takes the place of times 10 to the. Okay, so I'm going to do that. And then I like to push enter so it stores it. And then I go divided by 1.9 e uh, 14. Remember, e stands for times 10 to the. If you don't use the e button, you need to put parentheses around your numbers, okay? Okay, and this is my unrounded answer, 1.5789 times 10 to the 10th. And let's figure out how many sig figs we need to round to. I see three sig figs here. I see two sig figs here. So I need to have two sig figs in my final answer. So I'm going to look at my third sig fig over. It's a 7. Because it's 5 or above, it's going to bump that up. So it's just going to be 1.6 times 10 to the 10th. Okay. All right. That's how you do that. Let's flip. Okay. Label each as a physical or chemical property. Okay. <clears throat> Forms green carbonate when exposed to moist air. Okay, that would be a chemical change. That would be a chemical change. Remember, if you see a color change, sometimes, oftentimes, that means a chemical change has happened. Okay, if I'm describing something, at, oh, sorry, property. I'm we're describing properties. And because it would change chemically when it do, did that, it would be a chemical property, okay? Um, the fact that something is colorless, that's just, you can just, can you observe that without changing it chemically? Yeah, you can observe that without changing it chemically. So that'd be a physical property. Solid at room temperature. That's also physical. Okay? You can freeze something without changing its chemical composition. If I take water that's liquid and I freeze it into ice, is it still water? Yep, it's still H2O. So that would be physical. Melting point, same thing. Physical. Liquid room temperature, same thing. Physical. Boiling point, yep. Physical. Because changes of state, those are just, those are physical properties. Um, conducting electricity, yeah, that's physical. That's actually physical. That one throws a lot of people off. Okay, because you can see if a copper wire conducts electricity without destroying the copper wire. Okay, density is a physical property as well. Okay, you can observe the density of something and measure it without changing its chemical composition. Okay, um, is it a solid, or liquid, or a gas? Let's see. This one's definitely a solid because if it, the particles are in a regular arrangement, they're nice and neat and tidy like that. That means it's a solid, okay? This one is a gas. 
very obvious that it's a gas because um, the particles are far apart from each other. They're moving quickly. They're in random motion. That's a gas. Okay, this one's a liquid. Liquid, the particles are still touching. They're sliding past each other, but there's not a regular arrangement. That's how you can really tell the difference between a solid and liquid is they're not um, in a regular pattern or arrangement. Um, that's kind of how you can tell it's a liquid, okay? Okay, solids have a definite shape, I'll abbreviate, and a definite, definite volume. Liquids have an indefinite shape, or you might say a variable shape, and but they have a definite volume, right? They have a definite volume. Meaning if I have, like, I just happen to have a drink sitting here. If I take my drink, and right now it's like in a cylinder shape, if I was to pour it into a square container, it would take the shape of its container. So its shape is indefinite, but its volume is not going to change, right? It's not going to suddenly fill up the container. It's going to maintain the volume, the amount that's in there, okay? Gas is, on the other hand, indefinite shape and indefinite volume. They'll take the shape of their container and take the shape of their container and they'll take the volume of their container. They can expand to fill up the entire container, okay? Write whether each shows elements, compounds, mixture elements, mixture compounds, mixture of elements, and compounds. <clears throat> this one's just compounds because it's two of the same thing. This one's a mixture of elements. Remember, if it's two things that look exactly the same connected to each other, that's a diatomic element. That's a diatomic element. So that's going to be a mixture of elements. This one, also a mixture of elements. They're not diatomic. They're just by themselves. Mixture of elements. This one's going to be a mixture of compounds. Here's a compound, here's a different compound. Mixture of compounds. This one is just elements because they're two of the same thing. Those are diatomic elements. And this is going to be a mixture of elements. Mixture of elements, okay? Okay, this one, we're going to sort these into whether they're physical or chemical changes. Okay, so let's see here. Boiling, that's um, physical. Um, burning, that would be chemical, okay? Condensing, that's just a phase change. Condense. Okay, corroding, that's chemical. Corrode. Okay, crumple, I mean, that's physical, right? Ferment, that's what I was talking about the other day with... Um, like at, if you go to a distillery where they ferment corn to make whiskey um, or any alcoholic beverage is done through a fermentation, that's a chemical change. Um, that's also how they make um, a lot of other things too. Um, I'll have to think of some examples, but um, a lot, especially a lot of other countries, they eat a lot of like fermented foods. Anyway, uh, melting, that's a phase change. So that's physical. Rusting, that's chemical, okay? That's, rusting is like you have iron, you have something in your backyard, it rains, it gets wet over time, it starts to turn rusty, that's a chemical change. All right, um, this, it shows two different, comp uh, two different elements coming together to make a compound, that's a chemical change. Okay, that's a chemical change. I'll just abbreviate it here to make H2O. Okay, because as a new chemical formula, new chemical compound. Freezing is a phase change, that's physical. Freeze. Um, oxidizing, that's chemical. That's similar to rusting, okay? Tarnishing, similar, okay? Exploding. Think about chemical changes being things you can't really reverse, okay? You can't, if some, Something explodes, you can't unexplode it. Grind it down. That's physical. You're not changing the chemical composition. Um, this, it's NaOH, solid, NaOH aqueous. It just means it's been dissolved in water. It has not changed chemically. Um, it's just been dissolved in water. It's still NaOH. You could boil that water off and get the NaOH back. So that is just a um, physical change. NaOH aqueous. And vaporizing, that's a... That's the same as evaporation. That is a physical change as well. Okay, trying to plow through this for you guys. All right, name five ways you can tell if a chemical reaction has likely occurred. Um, color change. 
Okay. Um, did it precipitate for? Remember, a precipitate. Precipitate. What's a precipitate? A precipitate is a um, solid that is formed during a chemical reaction. Okay. Um, a change in um, like a new smell. New smell. That'll do it. Um, if you see, and this is kind of related. If you see a gas is produced, meaning if you see bubbles, um, and a change in energy, so heat or light, heat, light, change. Oops, light, some kind of change in temperature, um, change in energy. That's another way. Okay. Okay, it says match the words on the right. Separate sentences on the basis of boiling points, like alcohol and water. Two liquids, different boiling points. That's classic distillation. Okay, so B. Separates by spinning something very rapidly. Um, centrifuge, centrifugation. Separate substances based on their movements through special paper, like ink, chromatography. We did that in our separating mixtures video. And separate solids from liquids using a porous barrier like sand and water. That would be filtration. You could use filter paper. Okay. All right, a substance cannot be separated into smaller substances by physical or chemical means. That would be an element. Chemical combination of two or more different elements, that would be a compound. Which of the following is an example of an element? Oxygen. If you can find it on the periodic table, it's an element. If you can't, it's not. Which of the following is an example of a compound? This one. Don't let this one throw you off. That's a diatomic element. That's two of the same. That's two oxygens. It has to have two different types of elements to be a compound. Okay? Okay. Um, label each as an element or compound. Silicon, that is on the periodic table. So it's an element. Sodium chloride, that's a compound because it's two different things together. Francium, that's on the periodic table, that's an element. Nickel, element. Water, that's made up of hydrogen and oxygen, so that would be a compound. Okay, here we have a chromatography experiment. I have the colors on mine. Um, sorry if yours printed in black and white or whatever. Um, hopefully you're able to see that on the computer at least. Okay, it wants to, it says, student. Um, used a piece of paper and water to run a chromatography experiment on some black ink. After 10 minutes, the ink separated into different colors. So here's where we started. The water went up, 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 and it separated like this. Okay, it wants to know what's the mobile phase and what's the stationary phase. Okay, the mobile phase is what is creeping up. The water, that's what's creeping up. So the water is the mobile phase. Okay, what is staying put? What is the thing that it's creeping up on? It's the paper. Paper is the stationary phase. Which color had the highest affinity for the mobile phase? That means which one moved with the mobile phase? Which one was most soluble in the mobile phase? It moved the furthest up. That would be blue. Blue moved the furthest up the paper because the water's moving this way. Which color had the lowest affinity for the mobile phase? That means which one moved not the, the farthest? That would be yellow. It didn't move very far. Okay, it says which color had the highest affinity for the stationary phase, meaning which one stuck better to the paper, which one was the most stationary, it did not move as far, that would be yellow. And then this says which color had the lowest affinity for the stationary phase, that means which one moved farthest. So they're like, the one that has the lowest affinity for the stationary phase is the one that's going to have the highest affinity for the mobile phase, and vice versa. Okay, all right. Last page. We're almost there. In each solution, tell whether each is a solute or a solvent. Remember, universal solvent is water. So most of the time, water is going to be the solvent. Not all the time, but like most of the time. Okay. So for example, if I have salt water, yeah, the salt is going to be the solute. Water is going to be the solvent. Okay. Chocolate milk, chocolate powder, solute. Milk solvent, okay, because the solvent is the thing doing the dissolving, it's the thing in the greater amount. Um, the chocolate or the solute is the thing that is in the lesser amount and the thing that is getting dissolved, okay. Lemonade, you have water and lemonade mix. Water is again the solvent, lemonade mix, solute, and soda. In soda, it's just carbon dioxide dissolved in water, so again, water is the solvent, carbon dioxide is the solute. Okay. Physical properties are either intensive or extensive. Intensive properties help us to identify unknown substances. Extensive properties cannot be used to identify unknown substances. Tell whether each are intensive or extensive. Okay, so intensive properties, 
they don't change based on how much you have. So for example, color. If I have like a little tiny block of aluminum or a huge block of aluminum, does that change the color, changing the size? No. So that's intensive. Okay. Melting point. That's an intensive property. People confuse that. Water, for example, melts at zero degrees Celsius. It doesn't matter if it's a huge ton of water or a little tiny bit of water. It's going to melt at zero degrees Celsius. Okay. So that melting point, that temperature at which it melts is consistent. It's an intensive property. Mass, on the other hand, is extensive. Okay. If you have a little bit or a lot of something, its mass is going to change. Solubility, that's intensive. Things are either soluble or they're not. Length, extensive. That depends on size. Volume, extensive. That depends on size. Density, this one throws people off. Then density is intensive. Okay, because density is just a ratio of mass and volume. So it doesn't, if it's something you can Google, it's intensive. You can Google, hey, what's the density of copper? It will tell you because it doesn't matter how big the block of copper is, its ratio of its mass to its volume will be the same. Okay, ability to conduct electricity, also intensive. Okay, all right, it says, what's the difference between random and systematic error? Um, if you want to pause the video, I wrote it down right here. I didn't want to rewrite it. So basically random error, there's no pattern to it. Systematic error, there's more of a pattern to it. Random errors um, have <clears throat> no pattern, while systematic errors tend to be in the same direction consistently. For example, if you kept on taking the, uh, the mass of something, and the balance kept saying that it was like 0.3 grams over what it should be. That's systematic error because it has something to do with the, the equipment you're using. So we can reduce random errors by performing multiple trials, and then we can throw out any that have random errors. We can reduce systematic errors by making sure our equipment is working properly and we're using it properly. Okay. Okay. On the heating curve, it says label the states of matter, solid, liquid, gas. Okay, so here it's going to start at its lowest point. It's going to be a solid. Then it's going to be a liquid. Then it's going to be a gas, right? Okay, and each phase change. The phase changes happen in the flat regions. Okay, so if I'm going from a solid to a liquid, that's called melting. If I'm going from a liquid to a gas, that's called evaporation or vaporizing. Okay. And then if I'm going the opposite direction, if I'm going from a gas to a liquid, that's called condensing. If I'm going from a liquid to a solid, that's called freezing. Okay. And then it says, um, tell whether each is endothermic or exothermic. So remember, as we're adding heat, it's endothermic because it's absorbing heat to do these phase changes. So melting and evaporating would be endothermic. Whereas if we were going the other direction, we'd have to take, we'd have to release heat, to take heat out. So these ones would be exothermic. Freezing and con condensing would be exothermic. Okay. All right. And that's all I have for you guys. I tried to make it as short as possible. You need to make sure that you are studying for your test, being prepared. Because remember, you don't have a whole lot of time to complete the 35 questions. So make sure that you're using your time wisely. And send me a chat if you have any questions.